Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Artistic Minds. Today we have Twitch's favorite Canadian, Kirk Shannon. Hope you guys enjoy. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Artistic Minds podcast, and I'm Brandon, obviously, and I have with me Kirk. Kirk Shannon. <laughs> had to remember which way I was uh, positioned for the camera. This is opposite, you know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Kirk, if you want to go ahead and uh, you know just explain yourself. Hey, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Shannon, and I uh, I do the art type of stuff. So, yeah, mainly inks and whatnot. I'm a full time graphic designer, so kind of the stuff I do on Twitch streaming wise is not quite what I do for a day job. But there is a little bit of a tangential kind of skills that kind of go across both of them. So that's kind of a, a blessing in disguise that way. But yeah, I just kind of do the do a lot of the art stuff as a hobby or my wife likes this tell, tells me stop calling it a hobby it's a passion so yeah it's a passion but passion i get to do in my free time so the first question that i had for you was what got you into doing you know inks and drawing and stuff in general yeah i would uh i think almost like every artist i've been drawing since i was a wee lad type of thing but um uh, definitely inks i wouldn't say is new thing i guess new in terms of uh, how long I've been doing art, but I've been doing inks for probably about seven years now. So kind of what got me into it is uh, I was doing a 365 day drawing challenge with a friend of mine because we were kind of like just farting around a little too much and not doing art maybe as we should have because everybody, you know, everybody, your friends and family keep saying, you know, you're pretty good at this art thing. Maybe you should actually do something as opposed to just drawing and meeting notes and stuff like that. So we decided to do this 365 day challenge read your one picture every day for an entire year and come around well honestly come around february we we're pretty sick of it already but uh by the time october rolled around definitely looking for something a bit different to do because i was usually just doing kind of digital stuff or pencils so i'd come across a post by jake parker which you may know who created inktober so i was like you know what i really need a change of scenery i've been drawing hundreds of pictures by this point let's and i've never really drawn with ink other than like just ballpoint pen stuff like that so i was like let's give this a go let's see if i can draw i made it this far drawing every day let's draw every day for the next 31 days in ink so did that and that's just how how we met how i fell in love with inks so doing the inktober and at the end of the 31 days i think i just kept doing it even mixing in with uh, graphite and stuff like that work work as well but definitely uh Ink had grabbed me at that point, so like it, it's it's such a cool thing to like hear that you started late in life, kind of, because I did the same thing. You know, it was like um, I think it's it was two years in February whenever I first started art in general. Actually, not art in general, because I was doing spray paint art before that. But you know, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I would echo that too. Like I. I think so I'm 40 now. So that would have been seven years ago. I think when I started that kind of journey, the 365 day challenge. So I was already 33 by that point. And I was like, you know what, maybe I should give a little, put a little bit more effort in doing the art, the art thing. So that's uh and again, as I said, throughout the, that year, inks were kind of keep popping up in my head. It's like, maybe I should try some of this. And then yeah, definitely grab, grabbed it and went with it after that. So. Yeah, definitely. The next question that I had was, do you have any like special projects or anything coming up like professionally with your day job or with your regular work or anything like that? Um, I would say with like regular work, there's not much like it's kind of, the work I do is generally for e-learning. So it's a lot of like UI and UX design. So there's, there's a special project every day, according to every manager that I work with. So there's always high priorities for all that stuff. So nothing, nothing too fancy on that front other than just the day-to-day -day grind because i've been doing i've been a graphic designer for 20 years now so bouncing in and out of design agencies and then e-learning mostly but as for special projects about more about my inking and kind of like my free my free time art so to say there's nothing too significant in the works i think obviously with uh 
current events and whatnot, it's kind of hard to set up anything in particular. Everybody's kind of hunkered down and just kind of focusing on, uh, for the most part, like improving their art and stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, no, there's definitely ideas that I always have kicking around in my head that I'd like to try at some point, but nothing kind of like I'm not tunnel visioned on like I need to do this type of a uh, project in the in the future. I more or less kind of just fly by, see my pants, and if something comes my way, I'm like, hmm, that sounds pretty cool. I'll try that. So that's kind of how I usually go about special projects and stuff like that. So, so the next question is, uh, what is your dream project to work on? My dream project to work on. I think this has been one of my. Uh, what, what? How would you describe it? One of the hurdles, I guess, I've had in since I've been doing the art, the focusing a bit more on the art stuff is that I don't really have a clear direction as to like where I would want to take my art in, in meaning that like not don't really have any specific dream projects I would like to work on. And like everything kind of comes into my head and it's like, that would be cool. It'd be cool to do like a comic book covers, but I don't really have a whole lot of interest in doing like comics per se, because there are a lot of work. type of things. So at, at this point, I'm just like, I just want to draw the cool, fun, pieces not that drawing like inter interiors and stuff that like that's not fun but it obviously there's a, as a, as you know a ton of work and doing hard surfaces and stuff like that and i'm definitely more of a figurative artist and like to do that so yeah it's something like a covers for a comp book or um doing book interiors like for uh, like uh, illustrations for novels i've done i've had the opportunity to do that a few times and that's been really fun so kind of like chapter headers for fantasy novels and you know you kind of have that old school Steve Jackson, Ian, Li Ian Livingstone. I don't know if you know those books. They're kind of like choose your own adventure books from the eighties. They're like fantasy style, almost like Dungeons and Dragons. And they would have like interior interior illustrations kind of sporadically throughout the book. And those are definitely kind of inspired me to do, do the art and the inking style as well. So doing something like that would be amazing as well. So, and obviously working in games would be pretty fun. Uh, doing something along the lines of like darkest dungeon style artwork, like kind of that 2.5 D animation stuff, I think would be super slick. And I, I dig animation a lot too. So being able to kind of, you know, stretch my wings into some of that as well would be awesome. So yeah, nothing too particular, just like, Hey, if something cool comes my way, I'm always like, give, give it a thought. And like, that would be my special project possibly. So, so the next question is, uh, what do you want your artistic legacy to be? Like, after you die at, at like 150, uh, do you want what, what do you want uh, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to think whenever they see your work? Uh, I mean, if they see my work after I'm long dead, that would be pretty awesome. That would be an awesome legacy. But uh, I think uh, just I guess through my artistic journey, hoping that I can inspire other people to do artwork as well, and you know pursue the things they they want to do artistically, no matter what it is whether it's like I, I i oddly get inspired by like it's not i don't think it's necessarily odd but inspired by other creative types of expression altogether like dance or movie or film or songwriting and stuff like that so if i can have a small part in inspiring other people to do artwork whatever type of artwork it might be i think that would be a, a mighty fine legacy and a, a groovy epitaph to throw in the tombstone i'd say it's funny that you said that because, like, I've I've been watching a bunch of people on Twitch and stuff like that do art, like you know, for the last since I've been doing art, <laughs> and uh, I take the most from you know people like you and people like Tony and Jen that you know they have the teaching mindset, but they're not teachers. It's like <clears throat> you can. You can describe things in such a way that anybody can understand it, even if they have no experience in art. And that's just right. something that's that's great for like anybody, to be honest with you. I try to do that, and I, I don't really feel like I'm comfortable with you know teaching people how to do stuff yet. But um, with my experience and learning stuff, I can just tell people what I learn, and then hopefully they can get something from it. Absolutely. And that's kind of the way I approach it as well. It's like, I, I don't really try to go out of my way like to think of like a, like a syllabus in my head when I'm streaming. I just kind of try to talk through my process when, when I'm remembering to actually talk about my process. And uh, 
you know, just trying to expand on that. And I do enjoy like when people ask questions and stuff like that, even if they've, especially like when people ask who like, they, they don't draw or they're just really getting into it. And they kind of ask like, what, how should I go about starting to draw or becoming an artist? And I think kind of fostering that excitement in people who may otherwise not have even ever tried art. I think that's something that's uh, pretty damn cool. And I, I hope to be a, you know, a small part of that type of thing. So, For sure. So the, the next question was basically, can you describe some of the process on like how you've gotten this far with your art and if you have any other goals or anything with it? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, so yeah, after the, the 365 days challenge that we did, uh, after that, I kind of, you know, come January 1st in 2014, I think it was, it's like, okay, you know what? I'm actually going to stick with this. I'm going to keep trying to do art, but I'm actually going to change the way I was approaching art. So I actually switched to more of a, a learning mindset. Whereas before I was just like, you know, just having fun or let's draw an orc and, you know, no rhyme or reason to it, but I actually started to practice. Like I would go to conceptart.org. Like it's an old website that used to have a lot of tutorials and pros on there. And then I would actually go through these old tutorials from like Ganam and studios and, you know, currently today, like there's like schoolism and Skillshare and stuff like that. So I'm definitely at a, at about that, you know, seven years ago, Mark, I started to go, okay, let's actually do figure studies. Let's sign up for some classes at the local craft college that had figure drawing classes with the time figure studies and stuff like that. And so I think that's just really what helped me push me to where I am today with, uh, with my, uh, my skill set. but there's still so much more to do i think it's obviously something that i think everybody should be have in their mind that they will always be learning till the day they shuffle off this mortal coil type of thing and be doing figure drawing classes every week is for 50 more years type of thing so but yeah just just a better mindset i think about you know putting my money where my mouth is and actually doing tutorials some active like practice studies doing a lot of uh, master copies stuff like that of like Frazetta and things like that things I just never even bothered with before it's just like I said just kind of hamming it up and drawing funny cartoons and stuff like that which is not necessarily a bad thing when you're starting out for sure but at a certain point there's comes that time where you got to kind of decide do I want to push myself to actually you know maybe make a little bit of money from this and stuff like that and that's when you got to start doing the perspective or anatomy and all that type of stuff so that's definitely kind of essentially the process I kind of took to get me where I am. And plus I think the habit of drawing almost every day is super important for me anyways. So having done that 365 thing on day one after that, I felt off because I was going, okay, I'm not going to draw. And then by the time it was like supper time, I'm like, I'm like itching. It's like, y'all got any more of them drawings? So I was like, okay, I got to draw, I got to draw. So Get, getting that ha habit of drawing almost every day, I think, is super important if you want to improve. So, and and definitely for me, it's what I had to do because I was just kind of farting around way too much before then with just anything that would distract me from from art. So, the next question I have is: um, if you could change anything about your artistic career, what would you change? Hmm. It's fine. There's, a, there's always those kind of questions that you think about, like, if I could go back and change anything, would I? But then you also, I always come to the conclusion, it's like, well, if I change anything, I may not actually be where I am right now, no matter what I change. But without getting too butterfly effect on everybody, I think probably just starting, well, no, actually, maybe, yeah. Uh, be, being a full-time artist, I think, would be pretty groovy, obviously. And I think most people who kind of do the, the day job thing know that, I wouldn't call it a pain, but just that challenge all too well. It's like you, you work all day and then you're, you're, especially, it's funny because the idea of working a creative job like I do, which is graphic design, you think some days it does help feed into doing art in the evenings and on the weekends and stuff like that. But also it creatively, sometimes it can just creatively drain you because you're, projects require you to be so creative even if it is on the ui and ux side of things 
that you're just scrap you're just like oh how can we make this the coolest new innovative thing ever and then by the time you're done work you're just like i have no capacity whatsoever to be creative in my own hobby type of thing so i think obviously if i could change anything uh, being more of a full-time artist or even like a 50 50 split of like part-time at my current job because i do enjoy the work i do at my job a lot say i've spent 20 years doing it so i definitely don't feel like i'm stuck in the salt mines like uh unfortunately a lot of people probably do in their jobs i'm very blessed in being able to say i can i enjoy my job my day job but yeah definitely being more full-time would be pretty awesome then i could focus a lot more and come in even better yeah and i think like luckily i've been getting like commissions and stuff ever since i started streaming uh, so it's been that nice kind of where I still work full time and then, you know, a little bit, almost like a, a 10 to 15% kind of doing the, the freelancing type of stuff. So yeah, as you said, if we can ease into the, ease that slider over, it would be obviously a lot uh, easier going than just going snap. You know, all of a sudden you're, you're a full-time freelance artist, have fun chasing down invoices and doing the legwork to kind of broadcast yourself out there and build stores and all that fun stuff. So that would definitely be a, overwhelming for sure a, a whole other type of challenge so the next question that i had was what do you think would be your greatest success as an artist and your greatest failure as an artist i would let's start with the failure and then we can end on a positive note <laughs> <laughs> i guess the failure i guess and there might be a strong word is that i waited probably way too long to actually start taking uh, I hate to say that taking art seriously, but taking my art seriously. And I still have, I still struggle with that a lot. It's like, you know, a, a lot of artists have that, um, what do you call it? Imposter syndrome situation sometimes. So when people say, hey, I really love your art. And I'm like, mm, yeah, you're just saying that type of thing. So, but the fact that I only kind of started doing this in my thirties, close to mid thirties in another kind of thing that's in a lot, analogous to that is that I sold my first piece of art ever last year. So at the age of the sweet old age of 39, I finally sold a piece of artwork. Now I wasn't really ever trying to sell my artwork. And I think that's where the, the failure comes in. It's like, you know, I could have probably in my early twenties, not early twenties, maybe like mid twenties to 30 started to actually like build a store or try to, you know, promote myself. I've been very terrible at promoting myself in the last little while. So yeah, if, definitely. Uh, working towards being able to be confident and promote yourself earlier in your career is definitely a, a bonus as opposed to waiting to to midlife type of thing to, to do that. But with that, I still don't have, it's almost goes back to that question, but like, you know, would you change anything? It's like, nah, I guess I, I am where I am because it's just where I'm supposed to be right now. So, but as for greatest success, I guess just my inking in this, this style that I've, I wouldn't say I've developed, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it is, there's other artists who have done similar styles and stuff like that, but I think I've taken what they've done and then just like every artist and grown up, grown my own kind of style from that. I always describe it as like recipe and then you have ingredients. So ha this type of hatching is an ingredient from Franklin Booth and this type of composition is from Mike Mignola. And then I use these kind of ingredients and then I make my own recipe type of thing and put it out there. So I would say that's probably like artistically be my, greatest success i guess yeah definitely like and i have always i've always told you that your stuff reminds me of frank joe and which is he's so good yeah <laughs> he's so good if you guys aren't familiar with frank joe look him up this whole interview will be available on my patreon for uh patrons only uh kirk do you have a patreon i do have one yeah yeah and uh we can give it to kirk too and it'll be on kirk's patreon as well so if you want to see the entire thing uncut, raw, you should see the stuff we cut out of this. <laughs> you just hit up one of our Patreons, or both. You never know. Anyways, uh, so back to the, the questions and stuff. The next question is, what or who inspires you to you know do what you do? What or who? I think just artists in general inspire me, kind of like I was talking about earlier, like... Uh seeing somebody do a really cool hip hop dance or somebody do an amazing performance on stage type of thing. Like those types of things inspire me in the sense of just being 
getting off my butt and being creative is just seeing the hard work that like that you know the those people put into their craft is inspiring to me so one of the coolest things i think about twitch has been just being able to see so many artists that you normally wouldn't have the chance to see unless they were you know so big that they had an art book because that's kind of how i exposed myself to art growing up was more album art uh video game books instruction manuals and you know the odd D kind of monster loose pages i could get back in the 90s so being able to have thousands of artists at your fingertips just to watch them and do go through the process on twitch is like super inspiring to me so uh even some days at work when i'm just kind of banging my head up against the wall design or ui design or something like that i'll just pop open some tabs and just kind of just see somebody doing ballet or you know somebody doing some oil painting and just like might trigger something in my mind it's like oh cool i can solve this problem this way and i think that's really inspiring just to watch other artists but more specifically obviously with my style uh franklin booth is probably my biggest inspiration uh he kind of i don't know pioneers the right word but he's like a golden age illustrator from the late 1800s and early 1900s who definitely frank cho was also quite inspired by with some of his ballpoint pen stuff but doing the kind of like basket weave hatching uh, some other artists like Bernie Wrightson, who was really big in the 80s, did a lot of cool kind of similar hatching styles and stuff like that, but really amazing kind of monster type stuff, which I'm definitely into more of the uh, the monsters and spooky stuff. So I like to kind of incorporate a bit of that in. And then obviously Mike Mignola is obviously a huge uh, influence on me as well in terms of uh, composition. I think that that man knows composition like almost nobody's business as far as I'm concerned and is shape language is just out of this world so definitely definitely folks like that and then obviously on a personal level like my wife's a, a creative person as well who does art and songwriting and stuff like that so she i think we feed off each other and help kind of inspire inspire each other do our each our own creative endeavors so definitely that way so can you describe the process from start to finish on how you complete an artwork or a commission I think a commission is probably a better, we describe the commission process and then uh, my own personal art takes a similar approach, but I cut out some steps, essentially take some shortcuts because it's my personal artwork. But for a commission, I definitely, you know, you kind of obviously you talk with the person, see what they, what they want. And then uh, usually what I do is I do three quick thumbnails and I tend to do those digitally because in digital you can modify things a lot quicker like if i drew the head too big i can just kind of select it and shrink it down whereas if you do that on paper you got to erase the whole thing and draw it again and hope you get it right the second time so that's just extra time that i don't feel necessary especially at a thumbnail stage i think thumbnails are super super important so sometimes i'll thumbnail like between like half a dozen to a dozen thumbnails and then when i'm happy with three of them i'll pick the three best ones and then i'll just kind of blow them up just a little bit bigger than your average thumbnail and just put some values to them so like maybe like a, the white value the gray value and then black value and then i'll send that to whoever's uh taking a peek at it and again this is sometimes the process i go with, through with my own art too and uh yeah, they usually you know somebody usually picks one or they'll from this one but another aspect from the other and then i do a final on a composition again digitally because it's just a lot quicker that way and then uh send it off to them if they're cool then we print it off i print it off on like a cheap piece of printer paper and then i usually just use some masking tape or something and masking tape tape it to bristol usually like strathmore bristol paper then i light box it through trace it all over kind of give them one more check say hey i'm going to be dropping ink on this if you you know if anybody has any objections speak now forever hold your peace type of thing and then you just start inking and then after that point it's usually pretty it's you're just kind of going through the motions at that point i always uh, there's like the 80 20 rule it's like 80 percent of the thought process and the the important part is done at that thumbnailing and uh you know digital stage i find and then once you actually get inking it's obviously seems like 80 percent of the work but it's just you're kind of going through the motions at that because you've already kind of mapped everything out beforehand. Yep, ink it. I usually use microns with a mix of, uh, if I'm filling in large areas of black, I'll use like Higgins Black Magic Ink, which is a really great kind of matte 
colored ink, whereas I find uh, India ink's got a, it's a little, it's a little bit shiny, so it catches light and reflects a little bit. Whereas this Higgin stuff is nice, nice, nice and matte. It just it's almost like velvet. So yeah, you go through, do that, and then if I apply gold leaf, I'll do that, which is a whole other mess generally. But uh, it, it usually ends up looking pretty, pretty slick, I find. But yeah, and then after you get all that done, you seal it, seal it up. You usually use like a spray kind of fixative or something like that to kind of light fast it a little bit and help protect it from the elements. So then you ship it and hope they're cool with it. Usually you send a photograph or something like that. And, it's uh, usually pretty good. So, and yeah. And for my, oh, go ahead. No, it's fine. I was gonna say, yeah, definitely. Um, but so whenever you're you're shipping it off, do you just like, do you have your own packaging, or do you buy packaging, or? So I use uh, mostly rigid envelopes that I just grab off Amazon for the most part. Sometimes I bought them locally in at the Canada Post here, but the Canada Post it just I'm assuming it would be the same as a. USPS just yeah. up chart up sale on everything. It's like, you know, something you get on Amazon, the exact same as like ha twice as much at your local post office. But yeah, I usually just use rigid mailers. So either eight by ten versions or five by sevens if I do like a smaller commission. And then I usually put them in like a it's almost like a comic book baggie. Mm -hmm. So I have a whole bunch of those that I'll put the actual piece in and then I usually pack up like a thank you card and some stickers and stuff like that. This is a, another way of saying thanks for for the commission and Usually send it, and I usually ask them if they want tracking because tracking is pretty expensive. I know it is yeah, here in Canada, anyways. It can add like, yeah, one, yeah, exactly. One of these, Something. yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't get one of like, those, anyways. <laughs> so like, you can you can ship like a a postcard size kind of piece for about six bucks Canadian, but if you want tracking on it, they're like, yeah, hey, there'll be an extra twenty dollars on top of it. So that's kind of something you got to discuss with your your client before before you kind of settle on a price if they want tracking and all that fun stuff. But So, lightning round, I'm just going to hit you with like random questions. Um, sure. Yes or no, or one word answers, uh, either way. Um, they probably will make you think a little bit because they're, they're like off the cuff. Um, so the first one, let's see. X-Men or Avengers? X Men. Favorite Batman villain? Scarecrow. Favorite movie? Alien. Uh, next one. Favorite video game? Final Fantasy VI. Nice. Favorite Star Wars character? Mmm, that's a. Uh... It's a hard one for me too. We'll do it this way: favorite good guy, favorite bad guy, and uh, for the sake of simplicity, bounty hunters count as bad guys. <laughs> uh, for bad guys, I go with Darth Maul. Oh yeah, I get. I think one. it's probably. I don't know much about his backstory. I guess they expanded on his backstory in the mm -hmm. uh, the Clone Wars cartoon type of thing, but uh, he just looks so freaking badass. It's not even funny. Design wise, he's just an epic character. Yeah. Um, good guy. I like Ray, honestly. Least favorite Star Wars character. <laughs> Young Anakin, pro probably. Young Anakin. <sighs> it's funny, I, I read uh, something the other day, and somebody said, "You know what? Phantom Menace was actually really good." And I do agree that it is a decent movie. Yeah. But it's just some of the, like, young, young Anakin's really hard to take, honestly. That could just be a weird bias that I have. He's just, just annoying. But I guess it's... it comes, comes by it honestly. The whole family's kind of can be a bit whiny at times. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Luke and all that. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, an easy target is obviously Jar Jar, but I don't even, we'll just erase that from my memory because it is just one of those things. 3D yeah. characters. It's kind of hard to go on that, I think. So, so Kirk, can you tell us where you can be found on the internet? Yeah, for sure. If you just, uh, you can probably search for uh, Kirk Shannon Art on Google and most of the links will come up. 
but yeah, for Instagram, it's uh, Kirk Shannon Art. And then Twitter is Drown, which is my gamer handle. And it was hard to change away from that. So D R E L N. And uh, yeah, on Twitch is just Kirk Shannon. So yeah, those are the three main places you can find me and my stiffs. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, smash that subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications every time I post a video. As always, I do stream Tuesday and Thursday, 12 to 6, and sometimes I do these podcasts on those streams. So swing by one of the streams and uh, we can have a chat. As always, I'm Brandon. I'll see you next time.